Good day to you all and um, welcome to this webinar co on COVID-19 with a focus on vaccinations. Um, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Copeland, um, former president of EANFI, currently vice president for global health at Emory University. And um, we're highly appreciative of our three speakers joining us today. And we're highly appreciative of all of you who've taken time from busy schedules, busy days, different time zones to participate as uh, for the discussion and the understanding of what you're doing and, and people on uh, the panel are doing regarding uh, vaccination programs for COVID-19. When we started EANFI um, over a decade ago, and some of you were, were present at that uh, meeting, um, one of the things we thought of was valuable was having uh, a place where leaders from national public health institutes around the world could share experiences and better understand issues and problems and challenges in their own world and in their own countries and in their own institutes. And here is yet another example of our ability to do that in an easy and congenial and professional manner um, with our three participants, and then the many people who are, are joining in in the discussion. So thank you all for these different roles. Some quick housekeeping items for us all. One, when you're not speaking, and I'll be guilty of this as well, and I'll try to remember it, please turn your microphones off. That, that, um, that's important because the quality of the sound, as we all know from other um, webinars, can be quite damaged by lots of lots of folks on the line with just the phone on. Translation is available in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And you can access that by looking at your control bar at the bottom of your screen and hitting and hit the interpretation button. And it's very simple. It'll give you those options if you prefer to uh, listen to the seminar in French, Spanish, or Portuguese. There's also an interactive feature on this that permits you to raise your hand. It looks like you're raising your hand. You see a, a hand in it. Um, you, can, you can double up on that if you want and wave your hand in reality, but also uh, electronically is probably the most efficient and effective way of doing that. The meeting is being recorded, so um, the slides will be available and the discussions, including questions and comments, will be available at the end. Please save your questions for the end. We've allocated a good period of time, almost half of the session, to allow for questions uh, and to hear from you. So um, do participate in that, but we'll save all the questions for the last uh, 25 minutes. We're going a, a little bit out of order today, but let me just remind you the purpose of our session is uh, to familiarize ourselves with three programs and three approaches, uh, basically focusing on COVID-19 vaccination, comparing the uh, activities of different institutes, where have they placed their emphasis, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what advice can you offer us, your colleagues, uh, from what you've learned yourselves. We're switching the order a little bit from program just to accommodate everyone. So Dr. Singer, uh, who is uh, Deputy Director of the Division of Epidemiology in the Ministry of Health in Israel, uh, will be speaking for the uh, is Israeli C CDC. So without further ado, I'm sure I've left something out, but I'll come back to bother you later. Without further ado, I'll present Dr. Singer. Dr. Singer, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm gonna get my share screen one second. You're getting going on once again. And here we go. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. So um, here we go. Um, so I'll just correct that. I'm not from the actually Israeli CDC. I'm from the Division of Epidemiology. Um, I work in the Ministry of Health, and we uh, are very active in the uh, immunization campaign, COVID uh, vaccination campaign. So let's get started. Um, is that going to go page down? There we go. So this is Israel. You see it in one little satellite picture of the whole country right there. It's a young population. 
uh, 9.3 million people, uh, of them 2.8% below, 2.8 million below uh, 16 years old, which is an issue for vaccination, of course. Um, it's a small country territorially. Our public health system is, is national and centralized, which is a big issue, which is a big advantage in, in this uh, national campaign. And we're based upon four national HMOs, which give um, almost all of our primary health care. So it was very uh, convenient to work with that. Um, we based our vaccination campaign, the key components of our campaign were based on an existing community health system as compared with the thoughts we had about bringing the army basically and opening back vaccine centers. Um, we went on with the existing clinics and existing health system, which we have working in Israel for 70 years now. The, uh, we had to vaccinate rapidly, rapidly as much as possible to reduce our mortality. We didn't compromise on safety. We believed that uh, at one wrong step could knock out our whole campaign. So it was very clear to be important to be too safe and not have uh, mis mishaps and not have, uh, well, adverse events always happen, but, but nothing of uh, due to neglect or poor management on our side. And we prioritized in a simple, very simple manner. Uh, we started out giving 60 plus was our first uh, raft of, um, of prioritization, along with medical staff and first responders. So it's very easy to define a person 60 plus, that's easy to identify and give them the vaccine on time. Um, we were very active, our public uh, relations department is very active in uh, encouraging vaccine uptake and fighting fake news. We have national em electronic medical records which help us track progress and adverse events and identify weaknesses or uh, slow spots with vaccine program and manage the risk. So we're, we're on that and we have actually date, to this day, daily meetings uh, chronicling where we stand, where we, where we have lapses in the vaccine, uh, any uh, adverse events, et cetera, and transparent to the public to get uh, people aboard um, with our campaign. Next slide. Um, so what are the strengths of our system? We have a strong centralized national health system and I really, I have it on my computer every morning. I know what's happening from Matula in our far north to Eilat in our far south. I have it all in front of me. Um, we have national health insurance which is covers for all residents, not only citizens, but also permanent residents. Um, we have four competing uh, HMOs, which give all almost all primary care in the country, um, but they co cooperate very nicely in this operation. Um, Israelis have ID numbers from birth, so we could easily connect data, uh, vaccine data with public, uh, with medical data, with a, a case of COVID, et cetera. Um, all community health care is documented on in electronic manner, so we have immediate access to all inter interactions, medical interactions. And we have linked data on every COVID test and every dose of immunization. And Israel had a lot of experience with emergency preparedness response. And our national psych is actually geared toward mobilizing in a crisis. Um, I guess you don't have to tell you much about that. We are experienced in, in crisis. That was all a big advantage in dealing with this issue. And the challenge is we'd never done a campaign of this scale. And we didn't know if the population would come to get the vaccines. It was, of course, a new vaccine which nobody in the world had any experience with. So we were concerned about that. And the health system was distracted. We had absenteeism in the health system and, and many cases to deal with. So it was a big challenge. The logistics are, were a challenge because it's the ultra cold storage requirements. We have 80, 80 below zero centigrade, very cold. A storage, we don't have, we didn't have such facilities in Israel at the time, and a short shelf life, shelf life at two to eight degrees. And we didn't know about the product stability, about transferring in between sites. We, Israel has about 1,100 uh, clinics, but you couldn't vaccinate them all those because you couldn't move the vaccines from here to there. We ultimately ended up opening up 400 clinics nationwide, central sites. Um, and we didn't know when we we're going to get the vaccines. Ultimately, we get them pretty much as we needed them, but we didn't know that in advance. Um, logistics operations. Well, we were centrally operated. The, as I said, we had daily meetings to coordinating the uh, the vaccine campaign. Um, every, we had a, we have a national leader for the vaccination project, and he was on the data every day. Um, we had U.S. based by the HMOs, which was not an obvious choice. Um, we had central location for for the ultra free storage, and it was from there. So you'll see a slide about that in a moment. And we made every person who came for a first dose was guaranteed a second dose. 
which meant saving doses for the future, and um, which means could have meant um, getting given less doses to other people, but in the end it didn't. It didn't. Um, and I'm going to skip down the, the, those. Uh, two. So this is our supply chain. Um, the vaccines were created and uh, manufactured abroad, flown into Israel at uh, 80 Celsius, minus 80 Celsius. We had two storage points in Israel, um, and they're distributed in, on demand about three times a week to primary locations. And as we learned how to split those big, big, big uh, supplements, big samples, we were able to go to community centers and ultimately we're now doing reach out in nursing homes and private homes. There was very recent split uh, individual doses and small uh, packages of vaccine. It was a challenge for at first. And this is our first vaccine. I guess you might know this guy on December 19th. And we ended up with 450, I was correct this morning, 450 sites in nationwide, which is, I guess you can't compare with, you know, different size countries, but um, for us, it was a, large number of sites to manage. These are our four on the side here, the four health funds, Klalit, Maccabi, Mujeres, and Lumit, and the hospitals also had the vaccination sites. And we were able to give a peak of about almost 200,000 or even 200,000 doses a day, which we thought was very impressive. We were amazed that our, we expected to vaccinate 60,000 a day, ended up doing 200,000 a day, so we were very surprised by ourselves. Seven days a week, which is not, Obvious in Israel, which is that we have a religious holiday every day, Sabbath every day, and we had less than two percent no sure for a second dose, and very small wastage, very very small. I don't know the number exactly, but less than one percent wastage. Um, this is our cumulative dosage. I guess this is a two. This is uh, updated to the beginning of the month, but five point two million doses first dose and four point seven million second dose all altogether about ten million doses. Um, here you have the number here, 10.2 million doses, 5.3 million citizens immunized, um, 4.8 million with the green card, which we understand is controversial in some places, but we have it. The green card, which allows you to enter certain places, hotels, um, all kinds of entertainment. Um, look at, this is the uh, coverage for our 60 plus, in 91% coverage for 60 plus, and the 91, this is including a recoveries, 91% coverage for 50 plus also, which is, we're very happy with that. Um, I can't really see my own slide, Frank, I've got some discretion, but we are the highest number of doses in the world per population. It won't more than one dose per, per person, 119 per, per 100 people. Um, and we lead the world also in the, um, those leading, receiving at least one dose, we're at 63% now, we receive at least one dose. And we can't give, that's more than that's saying that's less than what the truth is because the truth is that we still have 2.8 million children we can't vaccinate, so we're actually doing much better. I think 84 percent of the vaccinable population we've, we've already reached with a single dose at least. Um, this is our uh, vaccine curve, our I'm sorry, our outbreak curve. We had a you can this is a big wave in January. This starts only in uh, December. We don't go only we don't have two first two waves here, but third wave was a big wave with 8,000 rolling average per day. And it started coming down. Our vaccine started about late December, right around here. And um, we started opening, we had a light, we were in lockdown at the point, started opening up. But in spite of the opening, our cases started coming down. And we're now, even though the, the uh, almost entirely opened, not entirely, but almost entirely, look at our cases, 200 cases a day on average. So we really feel it's been great success. Hope that it'll maintain. We're not guaranteeing that's going to maintain. And it's going to stay like that, but we certainly hope so. Um, so we feel our, pro our program has been a great success and relatively little opposition. Our lessons, central management and distribution, broad, easily defined priority groups, central and uh, national electronic databases, a teamwork, which is very critical, and managing public per perceptions. Um, I think I'm on time, amazingly. How do I stop sharing? Stop sharing. Did you hear all that? Thank you very much, Dr. Singer. Yes, we heard it all, and I'm sure there'll be many questions on it. And uh, I'm sure many of us are envious at your results and, and uh, success in a period of time. But we'll come back to questions, and I won't inject any now. So again, thank you, and we'll be back.
to you shortly. <clears throat> uh, the next speaker, I believe, if we're going to return to um, the, the the schedule, um, will be. Uh, I guess we're going to do Dr. Fox next. Is that correct? I think we can do Dr. Shirin first. Okay, great. Thank you. Next, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tamina Shirin from uh, Bangladesh. Um, Kimonachan Kubalo, um, and who was uh, with the Institute of Epidemiology, Disease Control and Research in uh, Bangladesh and active in their National Influenza Center. So Dr. Shirin, thank you. Um, thank yours you. is probably the most inconvenient time zone and we appreciate your taking <laughs> just, time. Just after the Iftar, I have joined. <laughs> so please, uh, please continue. Okay, so sh should I share the screen? Please. Okay, thank you. So Can you hear me? I can hear you now. There was some static before, but maybe try speaking again, please. Dr. Shirin? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you're good now. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting uh, me as a presenter on the um, COVID experience of COVID-19 vaccination in Bangladesh. Uh, so you all know that uh, I am working as a director in the Institute of Epidemiology, Disease Control and Research. We are very much related with the um, COVID-19 related activities in Bangladesh, Bangladesh in terms of um, case search, um, sample collection and uh, detection of COVID-19 as well as uh, with the vac vaccination program in Bangladesh. Uh, so the Nash, uh, um, so uh, as um, IEDCR, that is the Institute of Epidemiology, Disease Control and Research, we are related with the COVID-19 related activities in Bangladesh. Um, so um, here the all the data regarding the COVID-19 um, thing is uh, main, the database is maintained by MIS that is um, information management system division of uh, DGHS uh, director general of health services and which is supported by IEDCR. Uh, the IEDCR I have already mentioned this uh, the case, case investigation contract testing this sort of thing is um, conducted by IEDCR and um, uh, and this is strengthened by the outbreak investigation officer and APTPB fellows and other staffs of IEDCR and uh, when there is any cluster IEDCR used to conduct the investigations and uh, we are also involved in um, uh, policy advice um, uh, guidance of local public man uh, public health managers and and also the administrators and different levels of uh, in the country. And IDC are also um, considered as a, a reference laboratory for COVID-19 in Bangladesh. Uh, and so uh, along with the regular activities, we also um, in, uh, involve in quality check of other laboratories. And when they are, we also involve in validation of different reagents that um, we used here. So this is the website of IDCR where, where we upload the um, COVID um, related uh, updates uh, in our website. Sorry, I, I forgot to share the screen. Um, then, uh, so if we talk about the um, vaccine related activities uh, and with, with timeline that is um, actually, uh, 
in December 2020, a core committee developed national deployment and vaccine uh, plan um, with the support from IDC, especially for identification of priority group um, utilizing in uh, the uh, vac vaccine data. Sorry, the surveillance data that is the, uh, the from the surveillance platform, we prioritize uh, the people who will be vaccinated and the, the, they are 40 plus and above and uh, to, uh, um, 7th of January 2021 DGDA ga gave the emergency user uh, use authorization letter to Covishield that is the AstraZeneca, which is um, produced in um, Serum Institute in, uh, in India and we are getting these vaccines and in uh, 2000 and, and is, uh, in um, 27th January 2021 uh, vaccination launched in Bangladesh in virtual presence of our honor Prime Minister, and in that day, five uh, persons uh, be being vaccinated, and after that, um, in seventh uh, February 2021, one nationwide uh, vac mass vaccination started, and eighth um, April, uh, the second uh, dose of vaccination started. So this is the Covishield vaccine that um, th this is administered in Bangladesh. Now we are getting these vaccines. Uh, if you look at the st uh, vaccine status, Bangladesh up to uh, 11, um, April 2021, uh, our priority, our target group is 40 years and old uh, and uh, older. Uh, and where our the number of uh, target participants are uh, 39 million and 500,000 and um, among them 5 million around 5 million they registered and uh, so the 17.8% uh, of the target population uh, being registered and among them the first dose was um, given uh, around five, uh, one, uh, 5 million and 600 around 5 million and 600,000 um, people that is um, here we achieved 60 uh, where we which is 79.9% uh, of our target. And second dose has started um, uh, since uh, 8th April and till now uh, uh, three, uh, 383,717 people got vaccinated. So um, we uh, now we will fill 5.5% uh, of the uh, target in case of second dose and it's going on. Um, and total AEFI cases were identified um, 940 so here we can see the uh, status of um, COVID-19 vaccination that is administered in, Bangla in Bangladesh versus the world scenario. Uh, in Asia, 2.97% of um, uh, um, 100 people are vaccinated, where uh, Bangladesh uh, is uh, in Bangladesh, 3.45% per, uh, percent of the target population got vaccinated compared to 44, around 47% in US, UK and 35% in USA. So uh, regarding the um, AEFI and AESI surveillance, actually IDC is going to start a active AEFI and AESI surveillance and the passive surveillance, which is conducted by the um, Director General of uh, Drug Administration. Actually for the active surveillance, IDC are, um, uh, already selected uh, eight uh, districts in around the uh, randomly selected eight districts in Bangladesh and the people who are already deployed there. It, uh, uh, we are uh, we are going to start it soon and uh, but but the passive platform that we are using now um, this is a very strong platform and which is aligned with the uh, epi platform in bangladesh and supported by who um, and we have also and uh, so this uh, aefi um, uh, committee is um, formed at district level as well as in the central level at I, uh, dghs that is um, Director General of uh, Drug Administration, where um, IEDCR is actively participating. And um, uh, we have this uh, AEFI um, uh, committee at the district level, as well as the central level that I have already mentioned. And um, uh, we also um, um, look for the uh, 
causality assessment. Um, it is done at district level as well as uh, national level, uh, and um, and we uh, sit um, together for to for this assessment on regular basis. And. Uh, and another thing is that uh, uh, IDCR has a hotline. Um, so we, we also get the AEFI re related information through this hotline from the individuals and from the uh, centers uh, where the uh, people uh, get vaccinated. Uh, so in that way, we can keep track on it. And if there is any cluster regarding this AEFI, um, yeah, IDCR conducts epidemiological um, investigation on this AEFI. Um, and uh, another th thing is that at the beginning of the vaccination, IDCR took uh, active role in development of guidelines regarding this AEFI and AESI. And, uh, so I, that is, I have already mentioned not that regarding this hotline number, not only for this AEFI, we also receive call for the lab, uh, laboratory testing of COVID-19 uh, disease-related FA, uh, FAQs and uh, vaccine FAQs. And um, uh, so actually uh, this um, hotline uh, um, number is operated by the um, uh, um, uh, trained uh, and skilled physician. They got training on the, on especially on AEF, uh, AEFI of uh, COVID-19 vaccination and all AFI reporting is monitored daily by IEDCR. We are also conducting uh, some uh, post-vaccine um, related research, that is uh, the, uh, the surveillance of, uh, on development of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody in Bangladeshi population following COVID-19 vaccination, which is conducted by IDC in collaboration with ICDDRB, where we are going to estimate the uh, COVID-19 vaccination response and uh, development of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody by ELISA. Um, we, uh, um, the the uh, another aim of this uh, objective of this study is to detect the level of uh, neutralizing antibody uh, in COVID-19 vaccine recipients and in selected population of vaccine we are going to determine the cellular immune response against the vaccine. Uh, we are beside this we are also doing the genomic surveillance uh, where we uh, we are doing the whole genome sequencing and phylogen phylogenetic analysis uh, by a consortium between uh, several government and non-government institute where IDCR is the lead. We are also facing ch some challenges that is the global supply uh, shortfall of COVID-19 vaccine. Actually, this is not the challenge for only for the Bangladesh. It is a worldwide challenge. Um, and we are, uh, we are now concerned over the effectiveness of vaccination ag against the evolving variants because now South, uh, we, uh, UK variant and especially the South African variant is now in, uh, existing in Bangladesh. So we don't know how far we will get the vaccine covered against these um, strains, uh, but so far we uh, learned from different study that 30 uh, it gives 30% protection against severe disease and 10% um, against the mild and moderate diseases, but uh, it will, as, as a whole it will give partial protection, so we hope that the morbidity or mortality will uh, go down. And another thing is that the recent upsurge of the cases in Bangladesh uh, the, uh, since the beginning of uh, March. Uh, so, we, uh, so we are challenging this, uh, 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 we are facing this challenge uh, um, uh, during this vaccination program because uh, some of the people, they, are, they got their first vaccine, now they, they become infected. So they, they, they have to wait for another four weeks for the second uh, dose. Implementation um, challenges. Uh, Source limitation, resource limitations uh, that we are fa facing and coordination among different organizations and sector for vaccination and surveillance. And um, vaccine hesitancy uh, fair to uh, um, AEFI and rumors, but uh, actually Bangladeshi population uh, that is not that much fair of uh, all those sort of things as because uh, people in Bangladesh are vaccine friendly. 
next step that are, that we are going, uh, we are thinking about that the government is exploring for different uh, vaccine sources and uh, vaccines uh, type uh, initi uh, in initi initiated second dose of vaccine and um, continuing first dose of vaccine for the target population uh, vaccine effectiveness and efficacy study are expected to give further insights and strengthening of genomic surveillance platform will give additional um, information regarding the circulating strains that i would like to stop here thank you thank you all for patience here thank you very much for uh, lots of material and a limited period of time so i appreciate it and um, obviously a very different scenario in bangladesh in terms of population size and mobility um, transport maybe maybe even uh, genetic nature of the uh, virus uh, between Israel and Bangladesh. But we're, we're giving you a spectrum of, uh, of, of the world's uh, problems with this uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Um, let, let us move on to the third speaker now. Um, Dr. Fox is uh, at the US Centers for Disease Control where she's one of a three person leadership team on the uh, vaccination plan for COVID-19. Um, shall we uh, continue, Dr. Fox, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, yes, we're seeing it um, in slide presentation form. I'm sorry. There That's it. Now, now it's in. You're you're ready. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share with you some information about the U.S. Uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, program today. So, um, so far um, in the United States, um, we have uh, administered over 192 million um, doses. So we're closing in on 200 million uh, doses uh, expected in the very near future. We have uh, 36, uh, almost 37% of our population has received at least one dose of vaccine and 22.7% are now fully vaccinated. So. Um, more than one in five of our population fully vaccinated. Um, we have much uh, higher rates of coverage in the older population since that was an initial um, priority population. And I'll talk a little bit more about that prioritization process in just a minute. Just wanted to share these kind of overall achievements of the program so far. Um, the coverage uh, does vary by uh, state, and uh, what you see here on the right is a map of the U.S. with the number of um, uh, doses that have been administered in, um, in each of our uh, states. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, how we got to this point. So um, we are using currently um, three vaccines in the US. We're using two uh, mRNA vaccines, the new platform um, that has been developed and uh, uh, makes up um, the majority of the vaccines that have been administered so far in the US. We have one from Pfizer and one from Moderna. Each of these requires a two dose series we also use the uh, Janssen uh, single dose viral vector uh, vaccine. Um, that program uh, or that vaccine became authorized in the US much uh, more recently and so um, has uh, made up a much smaller proportion of the program so far. So I just wanted to lay this out as the, an overall conceptual way of thinking about the program. I think these um, uh, topics were touched on by the, the previous speakers as well in their program. So we start with prioritizing populations and then we have to allocate vaccine um, according to um, uh, location as, as well as, as appropriate for those populations and then distribute and administer the vaccine and um, all the while thinking about uh, safety, uh, effectiveness, um, 
uh, how to ensure uh, uptake and then how to manage the, the second doses for those uh, vaccines that are a two dose series. And so underpinning that process, we have a, a um, very large set of activities in uh, communications, providing guidance to our states um, and uh, maintaining data and monitoring systems at the national um, level as well as um, addressing regulatory considerations. So, um, so let's go back to the um, prioritizing populations um, because initially, uh, as with um, uh, every, all countries, uh, we are dealing with uh, supply constraints and we have to figure out how to use the limited doses available. And also, of course, it takes um, a substantial period of time to ramp up a program and get a very large number of people vaccinated. So we have the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the U.S. that advises us on how to um, prioritize uh, uh, populations for this vaccine. Um, we've divided it into phases, um, and you see here phase 1A. Um, the, the first group that we started with is our healthcare providers and long-term care uh, facility residents. So that's like uh, nursing homes and um, similar uh, facilities that have populations who are generally at high risk um, <clears throat> from uh, poor outcomes from this infection as well as living together in a congregate setting, which also creates risk for transmission. So those groups were our, um, our highest priority. And then next priority um, is persons over the age of 75 years and what we consider to be frontline essential um, workers. This is our um, uh, police and firefighters. Um, emergency medical uh, technicians and others who are on the front line um, keeping our communities functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. And then uh, the next group is um, a next age group down, a much broader age group with uh, high-risk medical conditions, and then other workers who are considered essential workers. So, and then finally we have phase two, which is the general public. And um, we've moved um, quite rapidly, uh, opening eligibility for vaccination, uh, starting with phase 1A, moving through the other phases. And now all of our states are set to move into phase two by April 19th, so um, next week. And um, that will mean that everyone ages 16 or older in the U.S. is eligible to receive COVID vaccination, um, 16 being the youngest age that we have an authorized vaccine available for. So how do we make this happen? How do we get um, the uh, doses out there and delivered to people? Well, we use quite a few different channels for this. In the early phase of distribution, when doses were focused on healthcare personnel and um, long-term care facility residents, the doses could be provided to fairly focused areas to reach these priority groups because all of those groups can be reached through the facilities where they live or work. Once we expanded to the next group, um, we needed many more channels to reach the population. And so um, we uh, uh, created um, all the channels that you see here in order to both expand access and ensure equity and e equitable access to vaccination for populations living in uh, different areas and different types of communities or with various um, uh, limitations to their ability to access um, uh, certain uh, clinics or even um, uh, uh, travel to be able to uh, reach, uh, reach a vaccination site. So we have 
a lot of um, doses being delivered through our pharmacies where people can go to the pharmacy and get vaccinated without having to um, go through a doctor or other healthcare provider. Um, we're also making some vaccination available through doctors' um, offices. And that's an area that we expect to see expand as the program uh, 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 expands to reach, um, reach additional population. We have um, various kinds of special services that, uh, that the states have set up with mobile units or uh, working together with community organizations in order to reach uh, persons who are unable to come to vaccination sites, such as those who are homebound. We have a special uh, program set up with uh, our federally qualified health centers, which are federally supported public health clinics that provide care to underserved communities. And that's to try to ensure that they um, also have uh, equitable access. We have a special program through our Indian Health Service that- um, Dr. Fox, I'm, I'm sorry that we're, we're gonna have to rush you along a bit, I'm afraid, because uh, we're, we're Oh, we've okay. gone into the question time. Sure. Um, uh, to vaccinate our our um, uh, Native American tribes, um, as well as other um, kinds of uh, special programs and mass vaccination sites. Um, we have uh, set up a vaccine safety strategy to um, uh, ensure that we can detect safety signals uh, that come from using these uh, new vaccines. And we have both active and passive um, vaccine safety uh, monitoring systems, including a new um, tool uh, that is smartphone based uh, called vSafe that we um, uh, uh, offer to people who are being vaccinated so that we can conduct an automated check-ins uh, with them through their smartphones. We recognize uh, particularly with a new vaccine and particularly as time goes on um, and uh, that we um, uh, have to keep uh, uh, promoting confidence in um, the vaccination and ensure that people have the uh, information that they need um, and that they're receiving this information through trusted messengers. And, um, and so we have uh, a whole set of activities going on that we call Vaccinate with Confidence um, that is our national um, strategy to reinforce confidence uh, in these vaccines. And um, that includes activities that engage um, communities. And this is just um, a, a sample of one of our communications um, materials uh, uh, or, or uh, um, sources uh, on our website um, that we uh, provide to the public. And so I will I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And sorry sorry that our time is so constrained. Let's get right into the uh, questions. Uh, from folks. I know we've assembled a number. And um, if you remember, if you, uh, if you have a question, use the raise your hand feature uh, on the uh, screen. And I think you can access that via the, um, the via the participant list. Uh, Bjorn. Uh... Thank you very much. Um, and I, I also posted it in, in the chat, but I'd like to, to expand a bit. And, and thank you very much for, for very good presentations. I'm really curious to hear more from Israel about the adverse events system, because we, I, I know that you, you have a vaccine that hasn't uh, where we haven't discovered too many adverse, at least serious adverse events, uh, as we have with, with some of the other vaccines being used uh, in Europe and, and, and other places. Uh, but could you uh, expand a bit on, on how you are able to detect uh, adverse events? Uh, Israel 
being about twice the population of Norway, it's, it's easier sometimes to, to uh, discover and to detect adverse events in a smaller country than some of the larger ones. And also the delay might be shorter uh, than we have seen in some of the, the larger populated countries. So yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I will say very, very briefly, we have a little short time, but very briefly, um, we have a, a concept which is that uh, that that works in a routine day to day will work in emergency situations, and we actually use the basis for our, for our uh, safety reporting on our on a system that already exists for vaccine safety reporting, um, and it is based upon. Um, there are two options. One is the uh, provider may report. Maybe that be a, a doctor or a nurse could report, and that is identified data. We have we get data. With the patient's name, we go back in the hospital and ask for a hospitalization information on that patient. Um, and there is unidentified data, uh, like the CDC site we mentioned, there, the, um, I forget the name in America, that any um, civilian can enter, get on, on web and, and monitor a, uh, or enter a, a, uh, an event. And as we can't follow those up so much. Um, and we also have really active surveillance for events that are interesting if we concern us, for example, um, we can ask the hospitals, please give us all your cases of Bell's palsy in the last uh, two months, uh, or that's, that's worth it, or Bell's palsy, or um, uh, anaphylaxis, these things. We ask the hospitals directly for these, and we get the report, the uh, patient report forms and the uh, hospital summaries, so we have very good data. We can uh, generate a, an impression. So we have, I, th I think, a good system. Um, I feel it's it's good. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no gold standard for this, I suppose, but I, th I think it's a good system. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful and interesting, Francoise. Oh, Francoise, no. Uh, um... Please go ahead and. I okay. can jump in. Okay. Uh, okay. Th uh, thank you very much. Um, I had a, I had two questions that I posted in the chat. I had a question for Dr. Singer. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, what was the situation uh, regarding vaccination and also regarding the COVID uh, in the in Gaza and in the West Bank. That was my first question. We only may be able to do for That's a good first question. Do you, uh, can you answer, address that Dr. Singer? Very uh, cursorily, cursorily, is that the word? Um, I'm, I didn't do my homework on that, frankly, I should have, um, but we are vaccinating Palestinians who work in Israel, over 200,000 so far, but we are not involved in the direct uh, vaccination in, in the West Bank or in the Gaza area. And I don't know the, uh, the rate, the, the uh, rates there of uh, disease, the reporting rates. Um, so I can't really give you the information on that on the situation there. Um, I know they're they're getting assistance from international organizations for the vaccine program, um, but we are involved in direct in vaccinating particularly a Palestinian workers in Israel. Of, I said as I mentioned about two hundred thousand of those, but more than that I can't really say unfortunately. You had a second question, please. Thanks. Loud. No, thank you. My second question was for Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Fox. I wanted to ask her what uh, what what do you think would be the effect of the pause in the um, uh, the Johnson and jo Johnson uh, vaccination uh, with the um, yeah yeah sure. Um, I, I you know of course this presentation was planned uh, long before we anticipated that there would be this uh, current situation uh, in the US. I, I, I figured there might be a question about that. So our, our current situation is that we've um, identified six um, cases of um, clotting uh, along with thrombocytopenia, which um, uh, have occurred in persons who had received the Janssen uh, vaccine. Our um, safety team is working closely with FDA to investigate those cases and out of an abundance of caution, we have decided to pause our um, use of that vaccine while that investi those investigations are being completed. 
Our advisory committee on immunization practices is meeting this afternoon to provide us with um, recommendations on what to do next, whether we need to continue the pause or, or what to do. And so we're really um, uh, holding off on any further statements until we have those recommendations from ACIP this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I see in our, we have a question from a uh, good friend, Dr. Gao. George, nice to, nice for you to join us. Hi. Um, hi, Jeff. And uh, hi, Dr. Sinner. I have a question for you. So everybody in the world is talking something about the antibody titers or levels to protect for the infection or for the severe cases. Are you setting up any kind of a group in Israel because you immunized so many people? Are you setting up any group to test for the antibody titer for the research purpose? Thank you. Um, the answer, thank you for the question. Yes, we are testing for antibody titers. Um, we use them actually clinically in a very, very limited uh, fashion, but we are looking for a uh, correlate of protection. We don't, don't know that yet. Um, we are doing some several research programs to try to evaluate that question, but we don't have an answer yet, which I would say the, the big uh, holy grail is correlate of protection. We don't know that yet. So we're using it, as I say, in very limited fashion clinically um, and waiting for answers for this question, which everybody, want, everybody wants to know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Thank you, George. Um, Mauricio, Dr. Hernandez. Hello, good morning, everybody. And I also want to thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. And, and I have two questions that uh, were not uh, really uh, addressed. One is in relation to the, which is the priority population. Uh, I saw different uh, uh, populations that were set in, in the four countries that presented. But my, my question relates, if you are in a um, uh, setting with a limited supply and it's going to take you very long to, to vaccinate, I mean, w would you recommend to go with the more vulnerable, say with the people 60 and, and over, or would you recommend opening to try to reach uh, more, more people? Because uh, in Israel, the priority group expanded really fast. In the uh, 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 United States uh, also, and uh, uh, in, in the other country example, it was brought down to 40 years old. So I wonder if you have a recommendation there. And then my next question is, if you are in a country with using uh, very different uh, brands. For example, in Mexico, we are using six uh, uh, different brands of vaccines and types of vaccines. Uh, is somebody uh, testing if you can finish one brand with uh, another uh, brand? Uh, because, uh, you know, markets get really tight and it's difficult to get uh, the exact uh, second dose at the time you need it. So it will be possible to finish one immunization scheme, for example, Pfizer, with uh, uh, another vaccine, for example, uh, Sinovac. Uh, that's, uh, those are my two questions. So thank you very much, and thank you again for your great presentation. Mauricio, who are you uh, directing those questions to? Well, it, it, I will, would like to have an answer say from from in, in, in israel bangladesh or, or us that will be <laughs> oh, that leaves it pretty <laughs> open fine so if the if the three uh, speakers could maybe just um briefly uh, touch on dr hernandez's um uh, two questions so i will answer briefly my camera went and somehow went off i can't to get it back on so you'll don't see me now but you can, i hope you can hear me we hear you fine. Okay. Um, I think the priorities we chose are actually good priorities to use, even in a limited vaccine situation. We didn't know when we started out, we didn't know how much vaccine we would have. And uh, we want, we said, if we have limited vaccine, 
go for those at highest risk. And we included an, in that group over 60 and uh, healthcare workers particularly, and people working in long-term institutions, living and working in long-term uh, care institutions. Um, because if you have a limited supply, go for those at the highest risk. It seems to me that makes sense. If you have unlimited supply, open it for everybody, but that's not, not many country, countries have that situation. I think nobody has that situation. And so I think that the priority we chose was reasonable, similar to the US policy. The only criticism received was that the under 60 high risk group were not prioritized. In other words, uh, a cancer patient age 45 years old was not prioritized until rather later. So we were criticized for that, but you can't have it all. And so I think what we chose was reasonable and it's easy. The point is to have it easily, easily identifiable. 60 years old, people you have you have their age in front of you when you vaccinate, I imagine. You can say, yes, you are 60, you're on 60. Um, so that's, I think, a, a guiding factor. Interchangeability, we don't have an answer. We haven't uh, tried to experiment with that and we wait for the companies to tell us. Companies don't tend to, te to test that because it's not in their commercial interest to do so. So we don't really have a good answer to that question. Interchangeability is a question. I don't have an answer. Dr. Fox, any comments on those two questions? Just to add briefly on the prioritization, you know, we looked at reducing mortality as a, as a top priority and also um, the sense that we have an obligation to protect those who are putting themselves at risk in order to take care of others and thus the healthcare providers and the older people were the top priority. And I, nothing really else to add to what Dr. Singer said. Thank you. Good. I'm afraid we are near, uh, near the end minute now. We thank you all for our participation. There's so many more uh, good questions that I know the audience has, and that uh, and we face ongoing challenges. But speaking for um, the International Association of National Public Health Institutes, uh, we appreciate the active ongoing membership. Just just in this uh, discussion today. Uh, representation from Mexico, Brazil, China, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Israel, uh, and many others with questions to ask uh, are in keeping with the membership of ENFI and um, all those who, who have been active in it from its very beginning, some of them are present on this call. So we thank you all for joining us and uh, look forward to future uh, webinars that are pertinent to where we are in this pandemic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.